Okay, hello everyone. Um, yeah, as I was just saying, I'm sorry I wasn't at my office hour today. I just forgot about it. I'm sorry. Um, oh. um, I got occupied with something else. Okay. Um, So I'm going to uh, continue talking about, this is left over from last time, I'm going to continue talking a little bit about Carnap's response to Neurot from the from last week's reading, and then I'll go on to the new reading. Oh, and I should say the Goodman, uh, the first Goodman reading I just put up a few minutes ago. So... That's uh, on Canvas, and there's a link from the syllabus. Oh, Griffin, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, like going back to in-person. Um, is that happening to this class? Um, just wanted to get your opinion on that. <laughs> as far as I know, uh, it's we are going back to in-person, and... Uh, Well, I don't know. I don't think I'm allowed to decide it's not happening. Although I guess if no one wanted to do it, we could all agree not to complain, but I'm guessing, I know some people really don't like Zoom classes. Um, so yeah, I'm assuming that's happening for this class. However, uh, so 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 for me, that means I'll have to um, drive to Santa Cruz. I live in Berkeley. <laughs> I have to drive to Santa Cruz and give the, the lecture in person. However, um, I will still keep uh, streaming it on Zoom and also recording the lectures. So from your point of view, it's not necessarily happening. Well, someone said, my psych professor just like did a poll and decided. And what did they decide, might I ask? Online. Hmm. Well, uh... So Griffin, when you said please no, do you mean please no, don't stay online? Uh, that is correct. Okay, yeah. So I think if there's some people who really don't want to stay online, then I will then we'll do it in person. I think that's my job and whatever. But like I said, if you're one of those people who prefers to stay online, you pretty much can do it. Um I mean, I did this all of last quarter. Uh, it was a small class, but so online attendance count. Well, I don't take a can attendance, so yes, it counts, or no, it doesn't count. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, right, so... Um, I mean, I'm not sure, you know, the quality of the videos and the online thing is, will not be quite up to the amazing standards that I've set so far <laughs> in the sense that I think, like, I may be standing in front of the blackboard or whatever, but... Um, Yeah, so as Wilson says, what if people has, have COVID? Well, that's why I'm saying it's not an issue if you have COVID because I'm, the Zoom link is going to keep working. I'm going to bring my own camera in. Um, I did this all last quarter. It works okay. Um, so definitely if you can't come because of COVID, or uh, then, and also I'm going to...
Sorry, speaking of my amazing technical standards. Oh no, I guess that's still working. That's just saying from before. Okay. Um, um, Okay, as, so as I've just said several times, pe you know, people are asking, can we stay on Zoom for this, that, and the other reason? I'm just saying, anyone can stay on Zoom who wants to, except me. The Zoom link is going to keep working. The lectures are going to still be recorded and put up on YouTube. And so if you don't want to come in, either because you're sick or because you just don't feel like coming in, then you're welcome to either join by a zoom by a zoom or watch the recordings or i mean like since i as i said i don't take attendance you know i mean you're welcome to just forget about the class entirely if you don't care about your grade <laughs> um, but or, no i should say if you think you can do the assignments okay without listening to the lectures um so uh Yes, so definitely people who want to stay on Zoom for whatever reason, except me, <laughs> everyone else who wants to stay on Zoom for, for whatever reason, is uh, that I'm totally fine with that. You don't need an excuse or anything. Okay, are there other questions about that? Okay. Um, all right, so back to this. So, I mean, I'm assuming that the school is actually going to go back online. I haven't heard anything to the contrary yet. Um, it's a little strange because the, you know, surge is still very much going on, but, you know, I, I'm not too worried about it. I'm going to, you know, have a my N95 mask and I'll stand far away from everyone and probably be fine. Uh, office hours will still be via Zoom, and hopefully in the future I will remember to go to them. Okay. Um, all right, back to this. Yeah, Ryan says there's probably going to be like, yeah, I, I, I don't know how much, I mean, if you can come and you want to come, please come, because I don't really want to feel like I'm driving to Santa Cruz and back and there's no one there i mean if there literally is no one there i'll stop doing it but it sounds like that's not what's going to happen okay sorry so uh back to carnap and neurot we spent a lot of time well 10 minutes okay um so maybe i should just skip over this quickly yeah, I'll just say, so, I mean, I said last time something that you can gather maybe about Carnap's political response to Neurath, um, right, that he uh, perhaps is subtly suggesting that Neurath's way of thinking about the system language and what it's for and what we're going to do with it is... Um, um, imperialist you know uh right that the, the project is to make everyone speak our language and Carnap is saying that's not my project um but on a Carnap is so ryan says Carnap is bourgeois philosophy well i mean as i said before Carnap actually it's not like Carnap is is right wing or something or even i mean popper is um i don't think he would be considered right wing on the spec current spectrum of american politics but uh oh it's just a joke well yeah but i mean what i but i'm not joking i mean so 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 neurot like carnap and neurot are both on the left but Carnap is a democratic socialist, uh, and Neurath is a, you know, um, pretty, in the way understood by him, pretty doctrinaire Marxist. So they are different from each other, but it's, but um, it's not like the difference between Neurath and Popper. 
And that partly explain, explains why the, con, the, the uh, conversation between Neurot and Popper is much nastier. <laughs> All right, but anyway, uh, but, so, but on a technical level, actually Carnap, I think, um, you know, superficially it looks like in that response which is just called on protocol sentences that that Carnap kind of says oh well Norat and I were both right and you can choose which one you want but the truth is he actually changes his position quite a bit so I think he actually concedes a lot to Neurot or or accepts a certain correction from Neurot anyway and the 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 I guess, given limited time, the ba the main thing I want to emphasize is that whereas in the unity of science, that is the what in German was called the physical language as universal language of science, um, whereas in that paper he said uh, we're waiting for the re results of research on the nature of the given in order to decide what the protocol sentences should look like. In his response to Neurot, he says that what are going to count as protocol sentences is a matter of convention. So there's no research to be done on it. I mean, uh, research of various kinds may still be relevant to it, just as theoretical questions are always relevant to practical decisions. Um, but the question itself is a practical question, which sentences to accept without um, um, deducing them from something else first. And then he says, furthermore, we have various choices, but they're again conventional choices about how to treat those sentences those protocol sentences, where do the treat, whether to treat them as part of the system or as not part of the system. Um, if we treat them as part of the system, is it going to be a specific kind or is it just any kind of sentence that people are willing to accept? And uh, um, um, And he says there's advantages and disadvantages to these different various proposals, including there's one that he uh, that he says he got the idea from Popper, which is in some ways the most radical one. It's a version of making the protocol sentences part of the system language, but instead of making them sentences of a very particular form, as he takes Neurot to be suggesting, this isn't exactly what Neurot is suggesting, but never mind that. So instead of taking them to be a sentences of a very particular form, he says what he's learned from Popper is it's fine to just let anything be a protocol sentence that people are willing to accept. But then if someone challenges it, we test it. So the protocol sentence is accepted without justification, but under certain conditions, uh, we'll give it up. That's the way he understands Pop or incorporates Popper's way of thinking about this into his view. We'll see that Popper thinks that Carnap didn't, well, didn't fully understand him or that they still have such a basic disagreement that this isn't really the same thing as he's proposing. Anyway, um, that, I think, is all I wanted to say about Carnap's response to Neurot, even though there's a lot of interesting things in that paper, but I want to go on to the new reading. Other questions about that before I go on? Okay, so in a sense, the reason this reading is here is because of the Putnam paper. So in order to assign the Putnam paper, I had to assign the version of Carnap that he's talking about. Um, and the version of Carnap that he's talking about, maybe I should write this bigger because some people get bored with it.
methodological character of theoretical terms, and it's from 1956. And it was written originally in English. So this is the first thing we're reading that was written originally in English. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. And um, um, the last Carnap we wrote is from 1932. So there's a long time in between. Um, however, a lot of things haven't changed. So one thing that hasn't changed is the unity of science. Right, he wants to, the, the project of adopting a language for all of science is supposed to show that all of science is fundamentally about the same thing. Um, another thing that hasn't changed is um, that um, Carnap sees this as a cooperative enterprise that he's carrying out with other people. Right, so he's still holding on to the idea that we're gonna be past the, um, the kind of philosophy where everyone builds their own system from the ground up, or in some cases, builds several systems from the ground up, right, and discards each one and moves on to the next one. Um, actually, Putnam is famous for having done something like that. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, uh, we're working on this together, right? We are, he describes us on page 39 as scientifically thinking men. Um, again, now he's writing in English, so I can't tell you that it actually says mensch and it doesn't mean man versus woman. He says men. Um, some of the logical positivists were women, but mostly not. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, I guess it's kind of striking that there, there well, yeah, so these people like uh, Elizabeth Anscombe and Philippa Foote and uh, what's the other one I'm thinking about? They were all in Oxford all around the same time, um, but they were all kind of, they, they weren't continental philosophers, but they certainly were not logical positivists. Um, okay, well, so I, I don't know what else to say about that um, at the moment, but something definitely could be said about it. Um, I think, in a way, actually, this is, in the deepest level, part of what Putnam is attacking. This idea that we're all at work together on some long project, um, which eventually will bear fruit. Um, right? We have faith that this movement will carry the future, or something like that. Um, this is something that the new left activists, which Putnam personally was uh, in the 60s. And even though this paper is from 1962, I think he's already kind of on that. Um, well, maybe it's hard to say. I don't know exactly the history of this. That is Putnam's his political history. But, you know, one of the things the new left asked activists, their criticism of the old left is that you guys are sitting around planning this thing forever and nothing's happening. And meanwhile, there's a war and there's poverty and there's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's time to actually do something. So, uh, um, so I think Putnam actually is also on a philosophical level is fed up with Carnap and that and his associates in that way. Right? Remember at some point he says like um, 
the interesting question, which hasn't even been touched on in 30 years of writing about theoretical terms or what it, right? Like that's, that's that impatience. You guys have been fiddling around since the thirties and you haven't accomplished anything. So anyway, um, uh, that's what, but so that's another thing that hasn't changed. Another thing that hasn't changed is that Carnap is interested in showing our right to use certain terms, um, right? So that, uh, certain concepts, certain show that certain concepts are legitimate and so we can use them to make meaningful assertions. And um, that his motive for doing that is um, that we want to show that that can be done with all the concepts of science and we can rule out metaphysics. Um, right, so like on page 39, um, Talking about people who are skeptical about the possibility of drawing a meaningfulness criterion, ruling some statements in as meaningful and ruling others out as meaningless. And he's especially thinking about Hempel here. We're not reading anything by Hempel in this course, but if the course was longer, we would read something by Hempel. <laughs> it's kind of important. He's like a second generation logical positivist, basically. Um, so he says, the skeptics do not, of course, deny that we can draw an exact boundary line if we want to, right? That is, we can make a convention and call these sentences meaningful and those meaningless. But they doubt whether any boundary line is an adequate explication of the distinction which empiricists had originally in mind, right? So what we're working on here, again, is rational reconstruction. We want to um, show that the distinctions we originally made can be made precise. Um, something as similar enough to them that we're willing to accept that as the translation. And he's saying the skeptics think that that won't be doable for meaningfulness. They believe that if any boundary line is drawn, it will be more or less arbitrary, and moreover, that it will turn out to be either too narrow or too wide. That it is too narrow means that some terms or sentences are excluded which are accepted by scientists as meaningful. That it is too wide means that some terms or sentences are included which scientifically men, thinking men, would not accept as meaningful. There's that phrase, scientifically thinking men. So the point is, again, we're not policing science to, to, to like see if scientists have said something meaningless and cut that off. We're, we're taking it for granted that all the things the scientists are saying are, are, are meaningful. And so our definition of meaningfulness has better capture that. But we wanted to rule out certain metaphysical statements. And I guess it's clear in advance what some statements like that have to be. And, you know, again, I think it's clear because it's the, the very kind of statements that Kant thought uh, um, would get us get the foundations of ethics in trouble, like statements about free will and determinism and the mind-body dualism and so forth. So, um, so we're still trying to do that. Um, and the strategy is still basically the same. Still basically the same as in the Aufbau, namely that we start with certain terms that we evidently have a right to use. Now, I mean, evidently, according to what? 
um, among others, according to empirical science and common sense, basically. I don't think that's changed either. Right, so we all know, and moreover, science can explain why if there's a red sphere on the table, I can, you know, like ascertain that by looking at it. Um, so we begin, begin with some terms or assertions that we, well, it's basically the terms as in the alphabet, concepts and relations. We begin with some concepts that we evidently have a right to use in, so that statements with those concepts in them should be meaningful. And then we move step by step to get in all the ones we need for the purposes of science. But, okay, the way it's going to work is much more complicated. <laughs> and even compared to the unity of science, um, paper, it's uh, much more modest in terms of like um, how strictly we can demand that a meaningful sentence be empirically meaningful. Um, and so basically the idea now, the, and by the idea I mean the proposal Right, so we're still talking about a proposed form of a system language. Um, it's still one that the details of which we're very far from being able to fill in. But it's one that we that, that's important to understand that in principle, a language we could adopt a language of this form, and somehow like our intention to adopt. A language of this term form or to speak in such a way that what we're saying could be translated into a language of this form that's what's important and so the the form of language that's being proposed now is that first of all the whole language of science is split into two languages one of them is called the observation language lo and the other is called the theoretical language lt And what a language means here now, it's a little bit, well, it's, it's definitely more complicated than the logical syntax period, right? Than what he means in uh, the unity of science by a language. In the Aufbau, it's, it's not as clear what he means, let's say. So, um, but, so but at this point, this is the semantics period. Um, he's, you know, to specify a language means, first of all, to um, give syntactic rules for the language. What kind of, what variables and constants it contains. This is like specifying the symbols and how it's legitimate to form sentences and how sentences, you know, syntactic rules of deriving sentences from other sentences. But then also you're going to give, uh, uh, you're going to say things about what kind of model is supposed to correspond to this language and you're going to define certain logical relations in terms of like truth in any model and stuff like that. That part's the semantics. Um, if you if you didn't, not this again. Okay, anyway, <laughs> there's nothing much to see on the board at the moment. I'll just wait till this clears. Um, if you didn't follow what I just said, uh, it's really important, and it, I mean, to under, to fully understand what Putnam says, you, what Carnap says, or what Putnam says in response, you would have to get into the details of that. However, I think, um, I think it's a distraction from the real issues between them and from what's really important to Carnap at this point. Or maybe not, maybe not a distraction, but anyway, it's um, it's of secondary importance, let's say. <laughs> so um, uh, 
just going to use these nuts. Okay, so, um, oh, is this back? Yes. Actually, if we go back to in person, I'll go to using only one camera, which probably will work better. But okay, in any case, so the observational language is pretty similar to the outbound language. In fact, in some ways, it's even more restricted than the outbound language. Um, it's the rules are set up to ensure. Um, First of all, that there's a name for every possible individual object that we might want to talk about in this language. In principle, there could be a list of all of them. It's not guaranteed to be a finite list, um, but it's not required to be infinite either. That's part of the rule. So, um, You might, uh, especially if you haven't studied some set theory or whatever, which you probably haven't, you might say, well, I mean, what do you mean? There's infinitely many possible names. There always, always could be a name for every object. Well, um, there's infinitely many possible names but some infinities are bigger than others. <laughs> and for example, there's more real numbers than there are names. Um, uh, finitely long names, that is. Of course, every real number has an infinitely long name. It's just doing it, you know, decimal point, well, a finitely many digits, a decimal point, and then infinitely many digits. <laughs> um, but, uh, but as far as finitely long names, there aren't enough to give one to every real number. I'm not going to prove that now. But so, um, so this means that the observation language, for example, doesn't talk about points in a continuum because there's too many for them all to have a name. Um, and so it's supposed to ensure that, and it's also supposed to ensure, and I'm not sure exactly how to put this because uh, Carnap isn't completely precise about it, but I think it's supposed to ensure something like this, that everything we would want to say about those individual objects is the kind of thing that in principle, if the world cooperated, we could verify in a finite number of steps. Um, so as far as that goes, it's a little bit weaker than, or maybe a lot weaker than the Aufbau. I think there are things you can say in the observation language that, and some of them may be the ones that Putnam is pointing out, um, that there are things you can say in the, wait, you were able to hear me while I was frozen, right? No? Oh. Because usually you can hear me when it's frozen. Wait, when the, uh, when the screen was all black and static, you right? When the screen was all black, you couldn't hear me? Uh, I, I could hear you. Oh, you could hear me. We just missed you in the very beginning. Like, right when it happened. Oh, okay. Is there something I need to say again? <laughs> you're like, we didn't understand what you're talking about anyway, so how do we know? <laughs> okay, um, well, um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't even remember when it first happened, but I, you know, I, what I was saying is that the observation language is similar to the Aufbau language. In some ways it's even stricter, in some ways it's less strict, but basically the idea is that everything you can say in the observation language is about, um, is about things that we could in principle directly observe in a finite amount of time. Um, and I guess it contains, although he doesn't really say this, I guess it contains something like primitive protocol sentences as axioms, so to speak, right? Those are still around. So the, you know, so the point is the, the observation language um, uh, is not just a uh, language, but it, uh, like a way of talking about um, of saying that any old thing is true or false, but it you know it contains um, certain assertions that are uh, um, that are accepted without further justification, and those are the protocol sentences. Um, he, he, like I mean, so I think kind of doesn't say much about that here because he takes it that the details of the observation language are pretty much everyone agrees on and um, and they're just minor issues, um, which is probably true between him and Hempel. It's not true at all between him, him and Putnam, right? I mean, Putnam starts right off saying there is no such thing as an observation language. So it would have been nice if Carnap said a little bit more about exactly how he thinks it works at this stage. But like I said, it's something like the Aufbau language. Now, however, we're not aiming to get anything like all the concepts of science or I guess even all the concepts of everyday life in this way. I mean, again, Carnap doesn't say that and, you know, Putnam um, takes him to be trying to say something about scientific theories, what we usually call a scientific theory. Um, but, um, but, you know, Carnap gives psychological states. This is one of the things that Putnam objects to, but I think, you know, Carnap, Carnap for example, gives psychological states like angry, as examples of theoretical terms, and he suggests also that it's preferable to introduce disposition terms like soluble as theoretical terms. So those are, you know, not things that we only use when we're wearing white coats, right? <laughs> they're, they're just regular old terms, but they're gonna, they're gonna be stuck in the theoretical language. The observation language is gonna be very restricted. Um, so I guess I could say it's kind of like the Aufbau language. It's kind of like the protocol language from the unity of science. And that's not surprising because those two are kind of like each other. So that's the observation language. It's got, I guess, has got types, although there's, uh, I think it sounds like there's more restrictions on how you can do that. Um, but, uh, but anyway, it's got some hierarchy of, con you know, concepts can be defined in terms of the primitives. Um, but uh, you can't say very much in it. As for the theoretical language, um, it can have any form you want. Which means, you know, like uh, the methods for defining one concept in terms of another can be really complicated if you want. Um, the, uh, um, kind of models it can require can be infinite, can be, um, uh, big kinds of infinity so that not every individual object could have a name in principle. Um, 
And basically, Carnap says, you know, throw in whatever kind of logic and mathematics you want. <laughs> and he says, it doesn't matter because we're going to treat the theoretical language initially as an uninterpreted calculus. Now, I mean, uninterpreted here, like the word interpreted gets used in a, a weird and confusing way, I think, in this paper. And I'm not sure exactly how to sort out the different uses of it. But at this point, when he says uninterpreted, uninterpreted calculus, he's including the syntax and the semantics. So uninterpreted calculus doesn't mean um, merely symbols that are shuffled around, but it does mean that symbols are taken as standing for the members of certain sets, but we don't really care what the members of those sets are. All we care about is you know, certain uh, structural properties they have, like uh, that you can define a successor, successor relation on them, or that they have infinite cardinality, or things like that. They're infinitely big, right? Um, so this is a language for talking about something, but we've left it completely up in the air what the something is. And therefore, Carnap says, you can't complain about whatever rules we set up for doing that because, um, you know, we're allowed to discuss different possible mathematical systems and symbols for them. Um, uh, Right, so I mean, this has to do with the fact that the formal mode now includes formal semantics. So even though in some sense you're talking about what symbols could mean, you're, uh, it's in a formal way, which means that uh, everything you're saying is still tautological in some sense. Again, I don't know if I spent too much time talking about that or not enough. The main point is, Carnap says, since we're not claiming that the, initially that any of the assertions of the theoretical language um, mean anything in the sense that I can use them to tell you something, or to claim something which you can then hold me accountable for, um, it doesn't matter what rules I set up for this language. There's no reason for these heavy restrictions. We can do whatever we want here. So that's number one about the theoretical language. Number two, the theoretical language has a theory, T. The theory T is phrased in terms of certain theoretical primitives, which are, um, um, like names for things or properties that we introduce without definition. So what are those um, names for things and properties? Well, I mean, in the version that Carnap is suggesting, they actually are names for zero and the successor relation. So in fact, the entire theory T is going to be, well, no, actually, I shouldn't say that. There are more theoretical primitives. Yeah, of course, there have to be. So they're going to be names for zero and the successor relation, which allows us to build up all of mathematics. And then there are going to be names for basic physical quantities and relations. And so in this theory, we're going to say, using as much mathematics as we want, certain things about certain basic physical quantities. But as soon as Carnap says that, he does what I'm about to do and says, takes it back and says, well, but of course, when I say that these are the names for basic physical quantities, that's kind of the intention. But remember, the whole thing is still uninterpreted. <laughs> They're going to turn out to be the names for basic physical quantities. 
right? So it's going to say something, you know, like, you know, the gradient of, of whatever is blah, 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 blah. And, uh, um, and, you know, this gradient symbol is, you know, like, is a symbol from calculus, and it can ultimately be defined if you allow enough machinery for defining things in terms of the natural numbers. And this is the name of some field which has values of a certain kind. Um, but to begin with, we don't know what that field is. So we have this theory, and we can deduce consequences from the theory, and we can define new terms from the theoretical primitives, and we can get a whole complicated thing in the theoretical language. Um, but so far, uh, it doesn't mean anything, or I mean, it could be used, it could be used to talk about different things. Right, just as long as the things we're talking about have um, the, the properties that the axioms of arithmetic and the theory here ascribe to them. Um, so, uh, so how do we get this to mean something? And Karnap says, well, there's this other body of rules called the um, correspondence rules, C. And the correspondence rules, maybe I shouldn't draw them within theoretical language. They're kind of, because they're going to use terminology from both the theoretical language and the observation language. And what the correspondence rules allow you to do is to infer in some special cases from some statements in the observation language to some statements in the theoretical language or the other way. I don't think it's re required that any of them be equivalents, right? That there be any if and only ifs. Um, it's enough if some go this way and some go that way. So like, for example, here will be a statement in the observation language that says I'm holding two things in my hand and one is feels heavier than the other. And here will be a statement of the theoretical language that says at the following space-time coordinates, there is, you know, within the following uh, region defined in terms of its space-time coordinates, there is more mass than in this other region defined by space-time coordinates. Where mass is one of the theoretical primitives, or is defined in terms of the th theoretical primitives. And then, you know, there may be another rule going back from, you know, like, so based on this, I may be able to um, predict, uh, you know, like uh, the frequency with which a pendulum will go back and forth if it's attached to one mass versus the other, where again the pendulum is described in terms of a distribution of fields at space-time coordinates, um, and then uh, maybe some statement about the frequency of motion of the pendulum will be translated back here into something like, you know, uh, I see a black spot here moving faster than the black spot here. Or, or you know, going back and forth more often than the black spot here. And, um, and what this allows us to do is to infer certain statements in the observation language from certain statements in other statements in the observation language 
by way of the theoretical language. Right, so I translate, I, I make my observation, this one feels heavier than this one, I translate that into the theoretical language, I do some calculations in the theoretical language, I, I say, oh, here's a result I can translate back into the theoretical language, I translate it back, um, and now, you know, I can see whether this happens or not. The theory predicts it will. So the theory predicts it will means now the theory means something, right? Now I'm using it to make a certain claim that you can hold me accountable for. Before I set up these correspondence rules, I could say whatever I want for, but now that I set up these correspondence rules, if I say, you know, um, like from this follows this, I could be wrong, <laughs> right? You can translate this into here, do this calculation, go back here and see, no, it doesn't look like that. So I've said something. When I talked, when I said this stuff here, I was saying something that could be right or wrong. You can check. I can be held responsible. I can be verified or refuted up to a point. Now up to a point because this only happens in certain special cases, number one. And number two, uh, it's an even more special case when it works just like this. So in so this simple case, like um, what I've assumed here is that from this translation, you know, call this O1 and this T1 and this T2 and this O2. So I've assumed that from, the, I can, from C I can translate O1 to T1. And then I've assumed that from T1 I can infer T2 without needing anything else. Now, without needing anything else, what do I mean by that? I mean, I mean without needing anything other than T. These are the axioms of the theoretical language. Of course, I can use them, right? That's the theory. So I can use them, but I don't need to assume anything else in the theoretical language. I go straight from here to T2, and now I'm assuming that the correspondence rules will stay, carry me straight back to O2. And if the only theoretical primitive in T1 is M, mass, and the only theoretical primitive in T2 is mass, then I've shown not just that the theoretical language as a whole means something. As you remember, Hempel agrees we can do that. But I've shown that this term, mass, has an empirical meaning. Right, because by introducing the theory of mass, I can make some predictions in the observation language without introducing any other theoretical things. So that's the first step. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't notice Ryan's question, but Yeah, no, I don't think it's quite that, but um, all right. Anyway, so that's the first step. We get in a few theoretical terms, Carnap says, because they feature in this kind of simple thing. But in many cases, it's not so simple, right? So I mean, in order to get an observational consequence from this translation of O1, I may need to make further theoretical assumptions in the theoretical language, right? Like there's no strong magnetic field, you know, because if I was holding two masses and they're both made out of iron, 
and it's a really strong magnetic field over here, then it will no longer be true that necessarily the more massive one feels heavier because the magnetic field will be acting against gravity, right? Um, magnetic fields in general are much stronger than gravity. It, you know, all it takes is a tiny little magnet and it sticks to the fridge and doesn't fall off, even though the entire mass of the Earth is trying to attract it. So anyway, be that as it may, so, uh, um, so I may need to assume that there's no magnetic field, and a magnetic field, how H may be like another theoretical primitive. Um, why am I calling it H? I should call it V. Anyway, the magnetic field, call it V, is going to be another theoretical primitive. So if mass is like this, then you know you need. Um, and here he uses the dot as and, right? Remember I told you that a million different things can be used to signify and. Here he uses the dot. So we have some sentence involving just um, the term mass. And we also have a sentence involving this other term, B, magnetic field. And we always have the theory. And we have the correspondence rules. And from all of this, we can, we can derive a new observational consequence that we couldn't derive without it. And the question is, you know, um, is this sufficient to show that these term that that um, this term is meaningful? And the answer is well, yes, but only if we've already shown that this one is meaningful. So that's why it's going to be step by step. We're going to take some where you don't need any extra sentences like this. So just a statement about mass and the theory and the correspondence rules would be enough to make a new observational prediction. And then we're going to add on other ones, which um, you only need mass and nothing else, and you can, it plus the new this new term, and you can get ob new observational predictions. So stage two, this term will get in. And then we'll introduce other terms that have observational consequences um, when you, you know, add sentences about the first and second stage terms and so on and so forth. So like I said, it's still basically the same strategy from the alpha. We start with um, some things that we definitely have a right to say. And then step by step, we introduce Um, a bunch of other things, and eventually, we'll hopefully we'll get in all the the theoretical primitives. If we don't, if we can't get some of the theoretical primitives this way, now I guess if there's a finite number of theoretical primitives. Um, you can determine that you've failed. I'm not sure if that's true or not, actually. Yeah, actually, I, I don't think that's true. You can tell if you succeeded, for sure, obviously, right? If you succeeded in doing this step by step and getting every theoretical term, but um, Given how complicated this language is, you can't tell, I think, that you've failed. You're, there's always going to be new possibilities to try out. So, um, um, so So the hope, the intention is that all the theoretical primitives will eventually be able to do this with. And notice that 
as in the elf valve, this is just a sketch of an enormous project that we barely know how to start. Right? It's not as if we actually know what to put in all these correspondence rules. I mean, that example with the two things I was holding in my hand, first of all, like to translate that into, state, into statements in primitive theoretic physical terms, um, um, I mean, uh, we can't even describe a hydrogen molecule in primitive theoretical physical terms without making lots of approximations. <laughs> Right? Let alone the situation that my body is in such a position and there's one thing in this hand and one thing in that hand. And then we have to find a general description that fits all the things that I can hold in my hand <laughs> from, you know, no matter what they're made out of. Um, this is just unbelievably complicated. Um, so either we're going to have to find even simpler examples, you know, like I see a black field with a red dot in the middle or something, you know, like maybe there's going to be some even simpler examples or uh, um, this is something that's possible in principle that we could never actually write out and one way or the other it's not like Carnap isn't actually telling you how to do this right now. Um, and so, like, the, the result of this is going to tell you um, um, it's going to show that certain terms, and again, hopefully all the primitive terms in the theoretical language, are meaningful. And then if you ask, well, okay, but what about statements, right? So, like, this is that same distinction, terms, statements, or assertions, I think he says in there. Right, this is that same distinction between concepts and, prop prep and propositions. We show that certain concepts are meaningful. Now, and the idea was in the Aufbau, and then if you make assertions in the right way using meaningful concepts, you'll end up with assertions that are meaningful, and therefore you'll have a way of determining whether they're true or false. Because meaningfulness has to do with terms or concepts, but prop with propositions, what we're really interested in is are they true or false? So, um, so you might think, even after finding out which terms were empirically meaningful, we would have to give other complicated rules for saying what assertions you're allowed to make with them to make sure that you only make assertions that can be empirically tested in some way. But Carnap says that's too strong a requirement. In fact, we're just going to count any assertion in the theoretical language as meaningful as long as it uses only empirically meaningful terms. So what that means is that if you have a term that in some cases can be used in the case of certain assertions, can, can be used to make new observational predictions. There may be other assertions you can make with that same term that can never, no matter how hard you try, be used to make observational predictions. And Carnap gives the example of something saying something like, the value of the field at this point is a rational number as opposed to an irrational number. So you know, all measurements are always give you rational numbers, right? I mean, no matter how you measure something, you're it's it's you're it's always going to be um, in terms of definite fractions of some definite unit. 
So no matter how carefully you measure, you can never tell the difference between a rational and an irrational quantity of mass or length or whatever. Um, so that statement, which given what we're allowed to, given that we're allowed all of mathematics in here, you definitely, you know, it's not going to be a misformed, right? Like, um, um, grammatically, mis syntactically misformed statement. The mass of this body is a rational number, but it's a statement that with no conceivable empirical consequences, no possible empirical consequences. And, um, right, there's, it's impossible to build a, a meter that only shines a light when the quantity is rational and goes off when it's irrational. <laughs> so um, Carnap says, nevertheless, because it's so convenient to be able to use all of mathematics to do physics, um, and using all of mathematics means, you know, that not all quantities are rational. Some are rational and some are not. Um, otherwise, you can't get the kind of continuity we want in order to do. Oh, is there a question? I don't know when you, Bennett. Did you? Oh ask? yeah, just a quick question. I just raised that a second ago, so it's okay. Good. Uh, uh, I was just, you said uh, what makes an assertion meaningful? I just catch, didn't catch what you said. So, well, I think I didn't finish. <laughs> I, I mean, I said what the answer isn't, right? So that is, you might think that in order for the assertion to be meaningful, it not only has to contain all empirically meaningful terms, but it has to use them in such a way as to make a statement that can be observationally tested in principle. Um, but... Uh, at least given certain background conditions, it could be tested, right? That is, given certain technology and certain, you know, and the world being set up right, this assertion could be tested, and that's what it would mean to call it meaningful. But what I'm saying is, Carnap says, no, because there are sentences that physicists need to say or be able to say and treat as meaningful that under no circumstances have observational implications, like the mass of this body is a rational number, a rational num that is a rational number of grams, let's say, right? So, um, so uh, Carnap says, we're just going to count any assertion in which all the terms are empirically meaningful as meaningful. So basically, sure. Thank you. yeah. So basically, we're drawing a line between meaningful and meaningless terms, and then the line between meaningful and meaningless assertions is just going to piggyback directly on that. We're not going to worry on the level of assertions whether this assertion or that one is empirically meaningful. Um, so it's, it's, you know, loose, <laughs> but if you think about what Carnap really cares about, it's, I think you can, I think you can still see why he considers this to be an acceptable continuation of his original project. Hey, Professor, it's lagging yes. again. What? Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes. Um, maybe I should stop using Minicam. Well, there's only one, in theory, only one more online lecture. Anyway. So what I was saying, I probably don't have to draw anything on the board, and you don't have to see me for me to say this, that uh, this you can see how this is still a continuation, or Carnap could still view this as a, as an acceptable continuation of his project. I mean, as I keep emphasizing, even in the Aufbau, 
although in principle it was possible to verify or disprove every um, uh, grammatically constructed sentence in the system language. Now we're very, very far from that. Nevertheless, even in the Aufbau, that wasn't the important thing, as you can tell from the fact that even in the Aufbau, there were plenty of sentences that, although you could do that with in principle, you could never actually do that with. And Carnap makes this point at some point in the paper. He says Ray, that like some people wanted to demand that, like Bridgman, I guess, um, who was a physicist, a kind of philosophical physicist who founded operationalism, <laughs> wanted to claim that a sentence is meaningless unless that sentence, you actually know exactly what to do and can do it to tell whether it's true or false. Um, Carnap says, we in the Vienna circle never, even at the beginning, adopted such a strict criterion. Right? There are lots of sentences that count as meaningful in the Aufbau, um, like some of the ones that Putnam mentions, like there is helium in the center of the sun or whatever, that uh, although in principle with some conceivable technology, there might be some way to verify them. In fact, there is, there's absolutely no way we know of to verify them. And the line between that and this sentence that's mathematically, so to speak, impossible to verify about the, the mass being a rational number, it's, you know, logically, maybe that's a really important distinction. But from a practical point of view, it's not a really important distinction. Right? The main thing in both cases is that we're saying the kind of things that, uh, that as a general matter, we know the meaning of. That is the kind of things that as a general matter, we're you know, somehow putting ourselves on the line, exposing ourselves to the possibility of proving or disproving what we said. Um, and that's enough to make, um, and you know, we're doing that, how are we doing that? We're doing that by, in principle, being willing to adopt this form of language, even though we don't really know how to set up this language. But that's enough to rule out metaphysics, because as in the Aufbau, when you go to the metaphysicians and say, you know, um, uh, okay, do you accept that in principle the term monad, even though we don't know how, is at currently, and even though there might be some sentences with it that could never be verified and so on and so forth, do you accept in principle that sometimes you'll be able to do this with it? They'll say, no. Um, you misunderstand us if you think that, that what we're saying could be translated to this language. Um, and that's the, it's that difference in intention is what Carnap really cares about. And all this apparatus is trying to make clear that like what it is that you have to intend <laughs> and to show that there is such a thing to intend, basically. Okay, I haven't left very much time to discuss Putnam, even though I said that I put in this whole reading because I wanted to, to discuss Putnam. But I will say something about Putnam. Putnam, so uh, Putnam is someone I knew. He died a few years ago, but he, he was, I didn't just know him, he was on my dissertation committee. So um, he was one of my teachers, maybe not the main one, but um, I knew him a long time after 1962. I hope that's obvious. I was born in 1966, so. <laughs> um, uh, but um, by the time I knew him, he was somewhat different. Um, but interestingly, um, uh, and kind of randomly, it just so happens that a friend of my father's was one of his high school classmates. Um, and, um, 
apparently his nickname in high school was Sit Down Hillary. <laughs> because he used to get up and start arguing with the teachers and they would be like, sit down, Hillary. <laughs> so anyway, um, as you can see, he was still somewhat like that in 1962. And even when I knew him, he was sometimes like that. Other times he would get kind of soft and fuzzy. But if you brought up one of these topics, the sit down, Hillary would come back. <laughs> You'd be like, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, that's just a uh, like personal <laughs> background. Um, so Putnam's attack on Carnap, in summary, is um, number one: there's no such thing as observational terms. So I mean, Carnap doesn't summarize. I mean, Putnam doesn't summarize Carnap's position here exactly right. Maybe he thinks the difference doesn't matter. Anyway, Putnam, Putnam doesn't talk about two languages. He talks about one language that has an observational part and a theoretical part. Um, I think from Carnap's point of view, it's important that they're, they're not the same language. I can see why from Putnam's point of view, he would say, what difference does it make? I mean, you have rules that connect them with each other. They're all part of the same language somehow. Well, so in any case, the observational language is like the, the primitive terms are supposed to be observation terms. Putnam says there's no such thing as an observational term. Every term can be used to talk about unobservable things. And he gives the example something that he says even a three-year-old child can understand. Do you believe that? Anyway, some child can understand this. People too small to be seen. Right? Like people, small, see. Are we even tempted to say that see or person are observation terms? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, Putnam is taking it that observation terms means like ordinary everyday terms. But, you know, let's take red um, and sphere. Um, you know, uh, seen is still an issue. That sounds like a psychological term. Too small to be seen. Sorry, I just now thought that. I'm not sure what to say about it. Anyway, uh, can't see. There are red spheres, right? So like according to Putnam, Newton thinks that red light consists of tiny red spheres. I'm not sure if that's fair to Newton either, but it, it, it consists of tiny red spheres. So that, But if you ask, where are these red spheres? You'd say, well, you can't observe them. You can't see them. But observable is, is a theoretical term, as Putnam himself points out. Um, well, any case, since I just thought of this objection to Putnam, I'm not sure what to do with it. Um, anyway, Putnam's claim is that, as you can see from sentences like people too small to be seen or light consists of microscopic red corpuscles, that um, um, that there's no term that can't be used to talk about observation, observational, observable, sorry, unobservable entities. And then on the other hand, he says that um, terms that can only be used to talk about unobservable entities shouldn't be called theoretical terms because that's not what we usually mean by theory. Or, and therefore, not what we usually mean by theoretical term. 
And he gives the example of satellite, which he says is a theoretical term of a certain theory, right? Like Newtonian celestial mechanics or whatever. And, uh, um, but it's, you know, mostly used for observable entities. Ryan, yes, do you have a question? Oh uh, yeah, professor. Uh, I was thinking about what you said about like how like Newton thought like, and I don't want to say like Newton said they're like, you know, microscopic, like red, red, like red orbs, but isn't that like, there's like a contradiction. If we can't see them, they can't be like red, right? I feel like, I feel like if you're including everything that's like wrong and contradiction, then anything could be possible. I feel like if we include like A and then negation A, then like and not A, then yeah, I, I feel like you can let anything in. When yeah. Carnap just be like, well, Newton, Newton used it wrong. Like, well, I, uh, well, no, I mean, I don't think it's, it's not a contradiction to say something is red, even though I can't see it. Um, um, I mean, there are red things that are too far away to be seen. Um, and, uh, Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to figure out what what the standard is here. What what would we ordinarily say? And I mean, like the this is kind of what I was going to say. It, I was going to say at the end, but like that maybe on some level the big issue between Putnam and Carnap is that Putnam is not just not willing at all to accept this idea that I'm proposing a new language that's supposed to sort of match our old language. He's like, we already have a language that works fine and we know what things mean. <laughs> right, so, um, um, but I mean, you know, Putnam I think is right to say that we normally talk about red things that are too small to see, round things that are too small to see, you know. Um, it's, it's a little bit, there's other issues about Newton saying that the corpuscles are red. I mean, I think red, like if red normally means that it reflects red light, then obviously in that sense, the corpuscles aren't red. <laughs> um, yes, Bennett. Oh, sorry, you actually were starting to get into my question. I was just saying, what exactly does it mean to be able to observe it? Because it seems like Carnap and Putnam don't exactly agree on, like... Well, so, I mean, one of the things Putnam says is that um, um, Carnap doesn't have a very good definition or that there is no good definition of what counts as observable and what counts it and what doesn't. You know, like you should be able to observe it without what a lot of equipment. Um, so, um, I think, especially especially based on what we read in the protocol sentences paper. Now, of course, there's several decades in between, but. I think if you said to Carnap, look, isn't it not exactly clear what will count, what should count as observable and what shouldn't? I think Carnap will say, well, uh, yeah, I mean, of course that's partly mm -hmm. conventional, <laughs> right? When we set up the observation language, we have to decide which things we accept as observable. And we're going to do that based on the results of empirical science and common sense stated in our previous language, but uh, that's not going to, you're going to fully dictate what we do. So there's going to be different ways of setting up observation language in which different things will count as observable. And, I mean, Carnap is like characteristically willing to accept, you know, situations like that. Like remember how even in the Alfbau, he was willing to accept the idea that what is a real object and what is a quasi object is a matter of convention. And when we decide to set up the language, we decide which things 
are the things we're talking about. <laughs> um, it's not going to be decided a priori or by introspection of you know pure essences or something. It's going to be decided on the basis of what we think we already know and practical decisions. So, so I mean, I think that's what Carnap would say about it. But I, but I know on the other hand that Putnam is, you know, either not understanding that or not accepting it. And it's a little bit hard to tell the difference. <laughs> Ryan says, "When do we get a philosophy without convention?" Oh, maybe never. <laughs> Why do you think you should be able to have that? <laughs> but uh, but uh, the short answer is that Quine doesn't believe in conventions, which is why David Lewis had to write his first book explaining why there's such a thing as conventions. I mean, well, that is because Quine believes in literal conventions, but he doesn't believe in conventions that establish a language or whatever. So that's when you'll get a philosophy without conventions. Um, <laughs> okay, Quine bestie. All right. <laughs> uh, you may take that back after you read Quine. He has his own issues. <laughs> In any case, um, I'm still getting through Putnam's objections. So, right. So one of his objections was that there's no such thing as an observation term. One of his objections was there is such a thing as a theoretical term, but it's not what Carnap is calling a theoretical term. It's a term that's introduced or that's used in particular by a scientific theory. So Carnap is just using the word theoretical wrong. And similar criticism, Carnap's idea that the theoretical language is starts off uninterpreted and becomes partially interpreted by virtue of the um, correspondence rules. Putnam says, you know, uh, no one has ever said exactly what they mean by partially interpreted, and here's a bunch of different things it could mean, and none of them are any good. So I conclude that Carnap doesn't know what he means when he says that. And then... Uh, finally, he says, even if all of that stuff could somehow be solved, um, there's a further question, which is, um, what are we even doing all this stuff for? What's the question we're trying to answer here? And Putnam says, is it the question of how we learn theoretical terms? Um, that is the terms of scientific theories. Well, this isn't how we learn it. And he goes into a little description of how we actually learn it. Are we talking about how theoretical terms could be introduced initially if we only had observational terms? He says, well, there never was a time like that. <laughs> so there is no such question. Um, now, um, if I had more time, I guess I could go through, I would go through each one of those objections and show why it's unfair to Carnap. Um, in that it perhaps deliberately misinterprets what Carnap is trying to do. Right, like, so for example, if you say there are no observational terms in our language, um, Carnap doesn't claim that there are observational terms and theoretical terms in our existing language. Carnap proposes a language form in which we separate observational terms from theoretical terms. 
if we accept that proposal, now there are observational terms, namely which, by definition, the primitive terms of the observation language. Um, um, and as I was just pointing out, like, if you say, well, Carnap, isn't it ambiguous how to do that? Um, uh, won't it still allow you to say things in the observation language that, you know, that can't be observed to be true or false, et cetera, et cetera? I think Carnap will just say, as Kant says somewhere, you know, my response to this objection is simple. I concede the entire argument. <laughs> I say, yeah, I mean, you know, but this can still be a good convention <laughs> aimed at the right thing, that is, at making sure we say things that can be backed up by um, empirical tests. Um, and, you know, um, I could say similar things about all the others. Um, so you might say, if I think Putnam is so unfair, why did I even assign this writing, this reading? And the answer is that, um, well, because first of all, Putnam, perhaps even more than Quine, this stage of Putnam sets the um, framework for going on in philosophy of science in a way that where most people think that they've put this kind of apparatus behind them. Um, and, you know, the one reason it's Putnam is more effective than Quine at this is that Putnam makes it look silly. <laughs> um, but secondly, I think this kind of unfairness in philosophy is kind of typical and unavoidable, and it's not necessarily a criticism of Putnam to, sh to say that he's unfair in this way. And the reason is because um, Putnam, uh, and this is the same thing I'm going to say about Quine, and I'm going to say, uh, well, I'm going to say this a bunch of times probably about various people, that, um, that Putnam just doesn't think there's any such position as the one that Carnap is trying to hold. That is, in some sense, he understands what Carnap is trying to do, or he might, at least. Not, even though I've known Putnam, I still can't say for sure how well he understood Carnap. I guess, oh, I'm one minute over. I should tell you this one story about Putnam and Carnap, though. Putnam told me that when he was very young and he first met Carnap, he was terrified of Carnap. And he said that Carnap was a, was a really scary person to talk to, that he had a really deep voice. There's a German, I can't do it, a German accent. <laughs> and you would say, well, you know, Carnap, I think blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, Professor, I think blah, 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 blah. And Carnap would say, oh, so you think and then he would say something that obviously followed from what you just said, and it was obviously absurd. <laughs> so, so actually, Putnam's original experience of Carnap was a little bit, you, you might not be able to tell from the tone of this article. But, um, but sorry, that was all a digression. What, so what I wanted to say was, you know, Carnap may in some sense, under, Putnam may in some sense understand what Carnap is trying to do, but he just doesn't think that makes sense. And so instead he'll attribute to Carnap the closest thing that makes some sense <laughs> to what Carnap is trying to do. And then he'll criticize that, he'll argue with that. And it's a kind of charity, which also um, is 
uh, at the same time a kind of injustice or unfairness to your predecessor. So that's also a reason to do this reading, to see that in action. I wish I could have explained it a little better, but in any case, um, like I said, for anyone who missed at the beginning, the Goodman reading is now, you know, because the book is on back, back order, I put the first reading from Goodman up on Canvas, and there's a link to it from the syllabus, and I'll talk to you about that on Thursday. Bye.